Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. We are in chapter 51. We've got uh, three chapters, well, two more after this. We'll talk about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit in two parts, and then we'll finish with the church, and then we'll hit eschatology finally. Uh, it's just, again, funny to come to the to wrap up. We're almost on our last uh, last section. Let's uh, jump in with our table discussion, and uh, as we talk about worship, I think this was a very practical chapter, wasn't it? I really enjoyed reading the scriptures. We're going to read a lot of scriptures this morning as well and have some good discussions. Uh, let's start with this at your tables. During times of worship, can you describe, this was question three, by the way, describe the emotions that are most prominent in your consciousness. Is this experience similar to other experiences in day life, or are these feelings unique to times of worship? Let's go ahead and spend a few minutes discussing that, and then we'll share out. Go ahead, guys. Let's bring this back together, guys. I, uh, I heard someone say, we're guys, we don't talk about emotions, right? There's some truth to that, isn't there? It's like, come on, really, we're talking about emotions? <laughs> what is this? Uh, but, and, and, and we didn't define whether this is personal time of worship or is this corporate with the church, and I heard discussions regarding both. So thoughts on this? To me, the music is, I mean, I love hear, hearing a group, a crowd sing the praises. I mean, the praises are meaningful individually, and, you know, I hum through the name, a lot of people probably do, but it's different. You get real, just kind of excited as, as you can hear a big a body lifting their voices. And yeah, just, right. Yes. There's something about the church gathering together, yeah, isn't there, right? You can't. Even better than that, when, when I was a brand new believer with the Promise Keepers, I had a you know, arena full of, of men singing worship. And that, to me, just, you know, I, I don't know, something about the low tones of a bunch of men yeah. singing worship yeah. was just yeah. I, yeah. I'm sorry. I had a similar experience. I went to Washington, D.C., so you had a million men. They start off with a hymn that always touches me, holy, holy, holy. And, oh, man, I, I couldn't make it through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cheering up at everything yeah. else. But the, and like you said, that low tone, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's almost a, it's a, a, a glimpse, a picture of, uh, of when, when John was writing Revelation and, and just uh, angels just worshiping the Lord and it, it, that a, a, a glimpse and a picture of what that might be and I was sharing with the group yesterday. I don't know if anybody's seen the sunrise uh, yesterday morning. But it, you know, if, between worship, between uh, this, the Lord's uh, common grace to everybody. But what 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 do you what do you see that as? What does that what does that mean to you? And um, uh, you know, uh, to me yesterday is just uh, um, you know I, I can only think of the, the one song by Casting Crown. I I can only imagine of what it would be like. Uh, just you know, this this is here on Earth in this is broken sphere, and um, of, of brokenness, and still the the Lord just shows just a a, a piece, just a, a little fragment of a beautiful sunrise uh, coming up with the clouds just kind of sweeping over, almost looking like a like a dove. In, in the shape of a, in the shape of a bird, and then on the left hand side is a is a rainbow type. I you you know yeah. it's just it's just yeah. you're you're just in awe. There's, there's emotion, emotion there, isn't there? Yeah. Correct, right? And it's not just because there's beautiful colors, but it's because we acknowledge the Creator who created all that, and that that's the that's the difference. Because lots of people, again, common grace get to enjoy the beauty of creation, but it's only the, the redeemed followers of Christ that we acknowledge the Creator who can, there, there's, there, there's a big difference, right? Yes, absolutely, there, there's emotion there. We, uh, it's funny, culture plays a lot into this in worship, doesn't it? There's a, there's, a, there's a culture where worship should be stoic, quiet contemplation, correct? There's, a, there's, there's high liturgy, there's high music, there's an organ, or it's quiet contemplation. That is the proper worship, or for some, the preferred worship style. And then, Wes, I'm going to call you out to hear our, our friend, his, uh, his father passed away, and the funeral was, when, when was the funeral, Wes? Yesterday. Just yesterday. I know I was talking, Pete and some others went, and Pete, 
first thing he said was, you know that funeral, here's, here's what he told me, was a celebration of a brother in Christ, of a true servant of God. And if you ever, he said, that church, it was a celebration of his life. It really was. And there was emotion there. And so you go to other traditions. And so think about in our, let's just use our church as the example. So some like to clap, right? But that's not, not everybody's doing that. Most are standing and singing. I look around and I see lots of people singing, which is good because I don't want that to just be a, a concert, right? Where they're just the performers on the stage our worship leaders are singing and the rest are, but people are participating. But generally, more stoic, right? We, we don't see d- disp- displays of emotion. It doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just, again, I'm saying it's just a cultural thing. But I wonder if, what would happen if somebody did become overcome with emotion? Or it went to the front and got on their knees or just expressed that? I, in some ways, this is where we got to be careful because we don't want to say, what, is, what are they doing? And they stop, they go back to your seat and stand like the rest of us, right? <laughs> I guess, I guess there is, right. <laughs> yes, that's, yeah, right, exactly. And so we don't want to stifle that, but where there is, I think, tradition and culture does play into this too. But here's a reality, as we just talked, if we really think, when you read Revelation 4 and 5 and hear the picture of what's happening continuously before the throne of God and think, we're going to be there someday. We'll participate in that. How could it not cause some emotion? It has to. I mean, this, I wonder where our heart is if we can read that with feel no twinge, no emotion at all. Or when we are singing a song, have you ever just felt just that presence of God when you sing corporately? We're singing, and sometimes it's hard to finish the line, right? Just there, there's emotion there. There is. And it's, I think that emotion is a natural part of who God created in us as a response to who he is. And I think we need to be careful. We don't try to stifle that so we don't, so we're like everybody else. But I think that emotion truly is, it has to be prominent for the believer who's worshiping, whether that's through a, through a sunrise, sunset, through the grace that God gives through life, or as we worship together, as we sing, as we come together corporately as well. Any other thoughts and comments on this? All right, let's uh, jump into, uh, let's define what worship is. So thoughts on this definition, the activity of glorifying God in his presence with our voices and hearts. And then he went on to say that it's an act of glorifying God when we come into his presence and consciousness of adoration of him. And so thoughts on that, because that's a, that's a different version of worship, because there's another broader term we could use to define worship. What would that be? This is a little more narrowly defined. Is there a broader way we could define worship if we wanted to? I don't know if you were able to read that in the very beginning. Because in all reality, think of our lives. I mean, because you could say that all life, what we do is a thankfulness and worship of God, correct? Every time we sit down for a meal, in our family's tradition, we sit and we thank God for providing a meal. There's a lot of people in this world through history have never don't get to eat and do what we do. So there's a thankfulness and a worship of God saying, thanks for providing this. Everything we do when we work, we do it all to his glory. So we do projects, we go to work, we do this, we do it the best that we can because that is a testament to God. So there's an act, there's a, there's a definition of worship that's broader that every aspect of our life is lived and should be in worship of God, correct? But this is defined differently in a more narrower sense that this is actively that we're actively glorifying God, a consciousness of who our God is, that we adore him and use our voices, hearts, our minds to do so. So whether that's, that can be done individually, right? You're riding in the car, you just see the sun, and wow, that's just so beautiful. Thank you, God, your creation, wow. She speaks of who you are. We hear a worship song that's in our heads. We're, we're reviewing scripture and we just, Lord, thank you. And, we're, and I don't know if you've ever done this, but praying and reading the Psalms as worship back to God is a just, a really amazing experience. If you've never done that. You know, just start reading the Psalms, but use them as worship and just read them aloud in your prayers back to God. As a, so we can do this alone. And then there's the corporate, we come and do this. Where we're singing with a small, and whether that's a church of 15 people or 1,500, <clears throat> coming together is just powerful because they're not doing that just independently. We're the called out ones. So Colossians 3 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is the call to the followers of Christ, right? We should be doing that and doing that constantly and certainly when the church gathers together. So the question then is why does worship become divisive in the church? We know this to be true. We are nodding our heads. Let's just use let's just use our own church as an example. Let's just not let's just say within the church, why does how does worship? Why does it then become something so beautiful, a picture of what's happening in heaven constantly that will be so? So then, why does it become divisive? Yeah. One of the, I think the biggest things that my dad pointed out as well is you know you never want worship to become about the people on stage seeing the audience as their goal. You want, you want God to constantly be your goal when worshiping. You don't want the feedback to be your end goal of, of worship. I think we get into the point where it's, it becomes a concert instead of a worship hall. Mm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah if, uh, so Grudem, I don't know if some of you have bought the, have the first version of the book. In the second version, he really changed the last part of it. He added a lot and redid it. And at the end, he gives kind of his own, he calls it personal observations on modern worship. And he writes it from the perspective of, I think he's in his 70s, so if someone from that generation, his take on, and it's, it is, it's his personal opinion. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, uh, but you're right. That's one of the issues he brings up too is, and I'd, I would imagine for a worship leader or anyone up there that's leading, just like the preacher, it must be hard. Pride's got to sneak in a little bit and say, Wow, people, because you're getting clapping, and this is a thankfulness, and not that that's wrong, but I mean, I think it would be just difficult for anyone who shares a spotlight. You got to watch that human pride, like, wow, I'm really good at this. And that's, they, I think that has to be prayed against constantly because that's it'd be easy to to do that because you're always in the limelight. People are clapping, wow, or getting lots of wow. You, your voice is just as someone who doesn't play one instrument and has a really bad voice and a narrow range about. This about just a few notes in my octave that I can actually sing. I really appreciate the gifts that others have because I don't have any of that. I love music and I love the gifts God's given to others that they can do that and help lead. Yeah. Uh, I think part of the struggle you know, for controversy is like the idea: can there be sort of a rock and roll church? You know, and uh, if you're if if you were part of the rock and roll scene, let's say, and you associate that with a lot of bad things, yeah. and then you're, you know, you come out of that, it's really hard then to, to take that music and try and worship God yeah. with that music. I've seen it done, and I kind of understand how it could work, but maybe it couldn't work for me. You know? yeah. right. right. There may be some past experience. Just hard to just hard to overcome. It's hard to think. I, I know what that scene was. My experiences in it were, were ungodly, and it's very hard for me now to, but that's, yep, that could be people have some, excuse me, some issues with that. It, there's a lot of preference issues when it comes to divisiveness, isn't there? We all have our own personal preference about what worship styles we prefer, right? We all do. Every And that's because we're all different. And so now you take a congregation, a large congregation, and gather, and you're going to have 900 different preferences, and so yet we're never going to land on what everybody prefers, correct? And there were some that would look at our church and say, that's a rock and roll church. Well, Josh is really hitting that guitar hard this morning, isn't he? Or the music's way too loud, and really, what's with the drums? Can you turn them down a little bit? And what happened to the hymns? Why don't we sing more hymns? And uh, you know what? I love the old hymns. I would love to see more, but I understand that, uh, I, I, that that's my preference. I really prefer, I would be okay with going back to the old hymn books and saying, uh, you've been calling out numbers. Remember we used to do that? And especially in Sunday night services, some of you were shaking your heads where it would be the first, when you were a kid, you'd be the first one to get your hand up so you could get the, and you would open it up and then the piano, the pianist would start playing that and you'd play, I don't know how they knew 560 songs to play on the piano, but they did it. And then you'd sing it with just the piano and the pastor would lead. I, some of you are nodding your heads and remember those days, and that been in my preference. There are others who come and just absolutely love and connect with our more modern worship songs. And anyway, that's uh, some churches have tried to say we're going to have a first service is going to be all organ and be traditional. 
The second service will be a mix, and the third service, all contemporary. So just come and kind of hit your preference. And anyways, there's been different ways that churches, but try to take, If I remember when my father moved from when the organ left the stage in the church back in, I think it was 1990. Major controversy because... <laughs> Why is the organ leaving the stage and being replaced with the drum set, right? Al. Yeah, we went through that. Because <laughs> I grew up the old way, and it was, it was hired to have drums and everything. But uh, I was thinking, <clears throat> even the environment, uh, when my wife and I found out this church is going to be basically dark and black, that was bothersome. I do have light and bright. Yeah. And uh, but if, I mean, believe me, it's not a problem at all. Yeah. But right. I mean, yeah. yeah. They said, well, we're, this is for the future. This is what people will enjoy more. Yeah. And but it was like you can hardly even see her. In a, why? Right. Like, so we have funerals in here during the week, or why do? So that's a that's a really good because. There in our worship service, it is very dark in there, and people have said, and there's a lot of varying opinions, with the vi- the giant video screen behind the preachers, that, that massive television, right? It's like, why is that on there? It's, it's just, the whole thing is different for a lot of people, yet we have to come back to and say, is this an issue of preference for me that is going to really allow me to, that now I can no longer worship? And so we have to be very careful with that, because... I, just, I, I would prefer more hymns, and I would prefer a lighter color in the sanctuary, and I'd be okay if there were no giant TV, but that's just my preference. I certainly am not going to go in there, and I can no longer worship because the ceiling's black, and there's a big TV behind the preacher, and, and uh, Josh is ha- hammering out the guitar chords, and I, that, it's okay. I don't have an issue with that. Is it my preference? I, but I don't know if my preference really matters so much as it does be able to corporately worship with all of you in the worship service. So, any other thoughts on that? Yeah. One of the other purposes that I've, uh, kind of a pride thing, is like, you know, you don't have a great voice, you don't want the person in front of you thinking that you sound like a dying cat. <laughs> so, you really don't want to, you don't want to, you know, phrase out loud because you think, you know, we don't want to be judged by someone else who's like, ooh, why are they singing? They have a bad voice when it's, it doesn't matter. Right. That's not the point of, of singing. It's not, if you want to be praised for being a good singer, go join a choir or go be a band leader or something. Yeah. Like you're, you're in a space that is designed to worship God. Yeah. You know, everyone else is doing the same thing you are. Yeah. So it's like right. a joyful noise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Joy is in the heart. It doesn't have to be to the ear, correct? <laughs> a good noise. Yeah, yeah right, right. For someone who comes from a family, I have an audience, okay? It's not great. My little brother has that. Yeah. 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 Wes, good to come. Yeah, I'm going to spin to it. I'm only going to speak from my experience. And in our culture, uh, like I was. Uh, uh, Pete visited my church. I said, that's the church I grew up in, but uh, I had uh, three brothers and three sisters, and I was the one, uh, of all, I didn't go to church that much. Uh, we had a uh, activity down in the basement. I was the only one. Uh, uh, the, I never was one. It was so much focus on entertainment at my point. In our culture, uh, we treat our preachers like they're God. And I think that when you lose when you lose your thought on what we're here for, and I picked it up at an early age, and uh, I thought it was too much focus on the people as you said behind the stage. So in our course, this is only my opinion, it seems like when people wait to Sunday they suppress um, the feelings, they don't have a voice, and that's the only way that they can out when they feel comfortable when they express their feelings when it's in church because they don't have that voice or or they articulate self during the week, so they kind of just go rapid and just get into me and just looks crazy, run up down the aisle and <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, uh, as people get more excited, uh, the pastor kind of elevated more screaming and get more people. It, it creates an environment whereas you kind of lost touch what's going on. So I, I was never afraid of it, but I was one. Um, I, I, I'm pretty bad. I, I call a preacher out and I say, you bleed just like me, you know. And, uh, and I just then, uh, I say, you're a man. And they, you know, they really focus on people's... Uh, 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 short comments in life, and and the, you, know, the, you know that's the only time they can feel. So it just get very. But I just never like that approach. I think that when you get to a point where it's, it becomes very disorganized, and 
And the focus really is not on God. It's just beating those drums, your earboard about to blow out. And, and you, if you write the <laughs> church, you don't know what's going up in there. Yeah. It doesn't seem peaceful. And I yeah. think that, uh, as my sister said, it got me in, in a state where people are, because, you know, everybody got joys. You know, only fewer people uh, may be screaming, but it's impacting the rest of the congregation because you lose some focus on the church. So. Yeah. And I agree with you. You have to be careful. You know, something like you made a point that you know we, we have to be you know, somewhat conscious of what we say because you know there may be that person who really is connected with who go down to the altar uh, to worship and people seem kind of weird. But I mean, in a way, that's good. But in my culture, I, I, it's more of who can scream, who can. I mean, that's what you know we yeah, you know, we bring up show our move, our dance moves, and all this other <laughs> kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, you, know, you bring up a good point because. Maybe because I couldn't dance. It was all fun. And I and I, I couldn't dance so soon, so I belong in the basement. Yeah. So uh, so that was a good time to show off your skills yeah. and you, and it's very impressive what people can do with them bodies, you know. So, yeah. so, so Paul addresses this to the Corinthian church, doesn't he? Because if you think of first Corinthians fourteen, we'll get there. He addresses that there was some chaos and disorder in the church that was causing major disruptions and a lot of trouble. And so there is a place where emotion can run and take, you're absolutely right. There's two extremes we're talking about here where Paul says, we got to rein this in. You got to have some order here. Have the emotion. There's got to be order because, because that's our testimony to the outside world too. And there just has to be to be able to worship to worship in the way we should. So emotion can run amok, and yes, it can be about, and this is where I have to be careful that it's not distracting. We've had people come, for example, from other church traditions to our services and worshiped in a ways that, especially if they're the, if you're the only one that's twirling up in the front, maybe a little distracting at a church where you have to also be mindful of the tr church tradition you are in at the time as well and say, am I being distracting to others? And emotion can, be a distraction and remove the focus as well. Absolutely, it can. It's easy to get caught up in emotion. Emotion for emotion's sake alone does not necessarily equate to true worship. It doesn't, and uh, because that's just emotion. It's easy to get emotional, if, but it's it's got to be emotion as a reaction and a recognition of who God is. There's a natural, I believe, emotion that comes with that. I don't think we should suppress it, but I think we also have to be careful. It's not being <clears throat> distracting as Paul talks about in his letter to the Corinthian church too, who was, they were just chaotic and he's setting them straight. So that's a really good point. Thank you, Wes. Let's, let's jump into this. Back in the Old Testament, so get, it, get your Bibles out or phones if you have them. Let's read some scriptures together. Uh, look up Hebrews chapter 12. We're gonna read that together. But uh, Exodus 7 says this. There's worship in the Old Testament. Uh, this goes back to Moses and Aaron speaking Pharaoh. And says this, and you shall say to him, to Pharaoh, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they, they, that they may serve me in the wilderness. Some translations say, Worship me in the wilderness. Said, Let them go, come out so that we can worship together. Now, I really love Hebrews 12 because if you look, I think it's verse 22. You're going to see two parts to this passage. You're going to see that Old Testament call in Mount Sinai, the fear, the smoke. You touch the mountain, you will die because God's glory. You will literally, you will, it'll end your life. You have to be careful and stay away. And then the writer of Hebrews contrasts that, contrasts that with what's coming in the future worship. And he looks at the old Mount Sinai, what happened with the people and their worship of God, with the fear and then the smoke and the fire and being careful, even if an animals go on the mountain when God is there, they, they won't survive it. And, then, and yet it's contrasted what's coming. So somebody wanna read, uh, somebody wanna read 18 through 24 for us out loud, please. We have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. Even If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight of that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Okay, stop, stop there, there for a second. So he's referring back, you can go back to Exodus yeah. 19. He's referring back to, you can read that at another time, Exodus 19, and said, now, watch what the writer contrasts this now. What a beautiful passage. Go ahead, Jen. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the 
assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What a contrast, isn't it? If, you, if you've read the book of Hebrews or studied it, what we see is the picture over and over again of the new covenant worship, where think of what worship was to God's people, the Israelites. You went to a temple where you were not allowed into the center, right? That was only for the high priest who went once a year in fear because there was that veil. Remember the whole picture when Christ died, the veil was torn? What an amazing picture for God's people to say that veil to the Holy of Holies was ripped in two. That cannot be overstated, the powerful imagery of that, because now we have access. So what we have, we can worship verse 22 through 24, and no longer, yes, is God still that same God? Yes, he is in the first part of that passage. Absolutely is, and sometimes we forget that. But yet, under the new covenant, we can now approach God, and we have a relationship to him that is we can call out Abba, Father, correct? And find mercy and help in our time of need and that that veil is now torn. We have access to God, that God's people had a very different view. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of, they had to sacrifice over and over again as a picture of God, that blood being spilt and it's a sacrifice for their sin and everything changed. So let's continue. So let's look at this future call. This again, this is the prophet Isaiah. Remember, this is uh, 800 BC. Let's look at this. Even in the Old Testament, we have this future call to worship. Uh, somebody read uh, this passage for us. If this is too small, go ahead and use your Bible. Isaiah 66, 18 through 21. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Pul, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands far away, that have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. And they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots and in litters and on mules and on dromedaries? Camels. Okay. Fancy <laughs> word for camel. <laughs> To my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, and some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites. So, thank you. All through the Old Testament, we see the call of the people to worship, correct? And there's this future picture that, that God speaks of a day when not just Israel, but all nations will come. And so we see that picture in the Old Testament as well. And there's... Scripture after scripture and incident after incident in the Old Testament where God's people are called and gathering to worship. So let's do this again. Let's do Revelations 5, Revelation 5, 9 through 14. And here is where the ultimate future picture we see of our worship, here is where, it's, here's where it culminates because it culminates in the future where we will worship with redeemed bodies. We will worship and see God I don't know what this means face to face, but we will see him. Our faith will be sights. We will worship in this. We, this is, we will participate in this someday, which is just amazing. So I think it's worth reading together because in Revelation 4 and 5, what a beautiful picture of worship. Let's uh, somebody read this. And he sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on earth, on the earth. And I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of living beings and the elders. And they sang with a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth <clears throat> and under the earth and in the sea, they sang, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to this city, the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the Lamb. Thank you. And if you go back just a chapter prior, 
We know that uh, day and night, they never cease to say there's the living creatures around the throne and that elders saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Can you imagine the day we will say those words in that mix? And so this is, if you haven't, I would really highly encourage you to read Revelation 4 and 5 and just think, because I think if we picture what we're doing as a church now, even in the, with the ceiling painted black and the guitars, but as a picture of what's coming, it completely changes our thoughts and our emotions and say, wow, we're, we, we have the privilege of doing this here, albeit imperfectly, but we have that to worship God now. And if we picture with what's coming, we can make the connection, changes the way we worship when we gather together as the ecclesia and the church, for sure. Let's keep going. Worship is an expression of our ultimate purpose for existence. Sometimes we forget this too, don't we? Isaiah wrote, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. We forget the ultimate reason why we exist is to bring glory to our creator. So when we worship, we are fulfilling our ultimate purpose, why we why we were even created in the first place. Sometimes we forget that. And if we can remember this, again, we'll change the way we worship when we realize that uh, that's why we were originally created, to bring glory to God. And this was uh, from Edmund uh, Clowney. This was, uh, uh, if you read the chapter, he had a big piece in there from a book that he wrote. But uh, this is what Edmund, let me just quote this, says that reverent corporate worship then is not optional for the church of God. Rather, it brings to expression the very being of the church, meaning this is what the church is. It manifests on earth the reality of the heavenly assembly, which is that connection to Revelation 4 and 5. <clears throat> and so we have that small piece now of the great, that eternity that is to come. And uh, so a church, every church, should place a very high priority and focus on worship. We should. And sometimes we, traditions put a high priority on the preaching, and I bet that's part of the worship too, and that's a good thing, but worship should be a, a strong primary focus of any, uh, of any true church. And uh, because that's what we are called to do. It's not optional for the church of God. Thoughts or comments? Before we move yeah, on. I just thought of what you said before, that our life is worship, because it's very common to say, Okay, we're going to go to church to worship, as if we're not at all now. But yeah. when, once we enter those doors, then we be, then we start to worship. Right. But that's not true. Yes. So. Yeah, <clears throat> right. Paul says to pray without ceasing. We should be worshiping constantly. But there is that place for independent worship, an independent study and prayer. There's also a place for the called out ones, the ecclesia, to gather because this is what we'll be doing for all of eternity. We'll be gathering together with all the angels and the creatures and the elders, and we will be able to say those same words someday. We get that picture now in the short life that we have. And we know this, that only God is worthy of worship, but I think it's just worthy. I got four verses here I think it'd be good to read. It's just a reminder of what the scriptures say about this. Uh, somebody read the Revelation 22 passage, uh, John's words. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down and worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. It's funny, any time that an angel appears in the physical realm, that's the response, right? Just absolutely. It's falling on your face in fear and worship. And that's just the angel. I mean, they're created beings just like we are. And so, wow, what's it going to be like to worship God face to face? Amazing. Okay. Uh, the angel saying, whoa, 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 uh-uh. <laughs> don't, don't worship me. Worship, worship God. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 5. Someone read that. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Okay, let's continue. Hold that word, I'm a jealous God. Uh, Isaiah 48, someone read that. For my sake and only my sake, I do it 
for how should my name be profaned? My glory will not give my my glory I will not give to another. Thank you. In the Revelation four passage we talked about, but let's go back to this. He's a jealous God. He says, I won't give my glory to another. What does that mean that God is jealous? We talked about that, well, two years ago. We went through um, the characteristics of who our God is. Um, what does it mean that he is jealous? These are the very words he uses to describe himself. He says, I will not share my glory with anyone, with anything. What does that mean? I think it means nothing else is worthy of of worship. I mean, God is, is he's righteous in saying that. We tend to think of jealousy in a negative way. Right? Yeah. He is the only thing in this world worthy of worship. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well said. Because we do. Jealous is usually right up there with envy and it's a sin, correct? You know, I've been listening to a little series on looking your ministry and the guy was explaining kind of maybe how Mary <clears throat> became such an important part in the Catholic Church. And he ended up saying, you know, if you kneel down before a statue of Mary and light candles before a statue of Mary and say prayers to a statue of Mary, he said, the Catholics will say all they're doing is venerating Mary. But he said, if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it's right. a duck. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Correct. Correct. You know, when we, when we, um, when we worship the created and not the creator, I mean, that is, that is what he's saying right here. Yeah. Um, you know, God is, God is who God is. God created whatever you are, you might be worshiping, um, whether it be, uh, whether it be your wife, whether it be, well, God's a jealous God. God. He's the one that, that put her there, and he deserves all the worship and praise and honor for that. So, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, when, you know, look, looking at the sunrise, it's like, wow, that, 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 is, that is awesome. God created that. So you got to give him all the praise, honor, and glory for that. Not because, of, not because of the sunset looks beautiful, but because God is so beautiful that he shared that with us. Right. Yeah, well said. Very well said. Okay. Let's continue on here. Next section was the blessings of worship. Take a look at that list for a minute. So when we worship, this is a this is a section. I just pulled these straight out of the chapter. These are the blessings that we experience when we come together. So just take a look at that and then just thoughts on any one of these that stand out to you that either you've experienced or just a comment on any one of these. When we gather together to worship, and even in our independent worship, these things happen. Give you a second to read through them. <clears throat> Thoughts on any would any of these stand out when you read through them? It seems that, you know, it's a, each and every one of those has, has you know, I I got an example and. Uh, you know, it's just uh, the, the Lord's enemies flee um, when, when you worship. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I think when the, uh, uh, I can't remember which one, but, but uh, when one of the girls was uh, was younger and, uh, you know, I ended up getting up from a nightmare. And, you know, it's like, okay, you, know, you go in the room, it's like, hey, what's going on? Oh, I just had a nightmare, I just had a nightmare, I can't get back to sleep. I'm like, look. Well, I'm like, I, I would encourage you to sing praises, sing praises to the Lord. I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the, the one song that, you know, we, we just, um, it was a, uh, a, a, a children's, um, ah, gosh. But, you know, just to, to, to sit there and, and to sing with her. And to, to to just try and uh, you know comfort her in that, but it's uh, you know the through the Lord's promise, yeah. and and you know and it, you know she ends up falling asleep, or you know and good you know to God ministers, uh, to, you know it's like wow well, you know I'm really I I have no idea how I'm going to get through this, and um, and it's like okay well uh, I don't I don't know what to do Lord. 
Um, so I'm going to come to you. I'm going to sing praises to you. How great is our God, and you know how how mighty you are, and and, and you just you just you you turn the focus off of your problems and you turn the focus onto Him, and He will make straight your path. Right. Yeah. Right. It re it reframes us back to reality, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, Pete, and then yes, absolutely Pete, and then Gary. So, as since my son's here, as someone who was very well trained to sing, um, you know, when I and I've sung here for almost thirty years now, when I came to Christ, so prior to that, and I was trained to to sing really well to get the applause of men. That, that was what I was trained for. When I came to Christ, that bottom one is the one that helps me keep focus in the right place. Mm -hmm. Because I can still sing as good as I did before. I can still use all that training the way I did before. People still applaud. But my focus is on if someone came to church that knew me before and hasn't talked to me, would they recognize that they are in God's presence? Mm -hmm. And that's what I try to tell myself when I'm up from singing. Because I don't want it to be about wow, that guy can sing just like Steve Green, or that guy can sing just like Laurel Harris. I want them to, to realize that they are in the presence of God. Yeah. Right, right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's do this. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. <clears throat> I really like this, what, uh, what Paul writes here about uh, unbelievers in the church. 14 verses 23, 24, and 25. Somebody read those three verses. 1 Corinthians 14. 23, 24, and 25. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, they will not say, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophecy in an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all. And verse 25. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Because that's, that's your true. goal as a worship leader, isn't it? Right there. That's an unbeliever who comes into the church and says, the secrets of his hearts are disclosed, he falls on his face, he worships God and declares that God, wow, God is really here. He recognizes that, and that should be the church, correct? As an unbeliever walks in and says, okay, may not fully understand it, may not even make a decision to turn his life over and repent at that moment, but says, okay, God's clearly, something's happening here. God's in this place and recognizes it. That should be our goal as a church. I really like uh, that second one. You ever thought about that? God delights in us. I thought they go hand in hand. What's that? I thought they go hand in hand, the first and the yeah. second. Yeah. Well, we delight in God. God delights in yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There were, there's a couple of verses. Uh, Isaiah 62 says, says, You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem or diamond in the hand of your God. Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He'll, he will rejoice over you with gladness. I think about that. I, we don't often think about that, that God's rejoicing in us. Gary? I was struck by those verses that he put in there. But another thing he put in there was an instance where Jehoshaphat put the singers and, and in front of the army, he said, in the Old Testament. And can you imagine putting, putting the worshipers in front of the army? And I thought, you know, the country is getting to a point where it's so divided that we're, you know, we may come to a place where there's, there's going to be like a race ride or something. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be cool if the church went right down between the two groups singing, you know? Yeah. It'd be like... I don't know, because I think when, he, when, God, when God says he'll fight for us, you, you wonder, could we really believe that? Yeah. Could we yeah. actually live that out? Like, go to, go to settle a matter in worship, uh, just hoping God will intervene and keep this thing from breaking out into a disaster. Yeah, because so, we sometimes, sometimes think that fighting for us means yeah. we need to yell louder on social media. Right, or we need to yell and scream, or we need to. But it's a, it's a, it is a, it's a great truth. If you really look at the way that worship was used, even in conjunction with in battle, you're absolutely right. It's a, 
it, it would be an interesting study. The last one we'll do is, uh, look at the third one. We draw near to God, and this is the amazing unseen reality of new covenant worship. Go back to that Hebrews 12 passage. God's people originally knew the God, the first part of that. That's how they worshiped. They were not allowed to go anywhere near that mountain. They were told, even Moses said, I'm trembling in fear. This is a, this is a fearful thing. So he had to put his hand and cover as he went by because Moses would be destroyed. And so this was a terrifying thing. The mountain is with fire and smoke. Even animals who wandered on there, keep your cattle away, because if you do, you're going to lose all of them, cannot be in the presence. That holiness, they will die. That was the God of the Old Testament they worshipped. There was fear and awe and trembling, and they had to stand back. They weren't allowed in the Holy of Holies. Nowhere near the Holy of Holies. And yet, New Covenant worship, we can draw near to find help in our time of need. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence. we got to think about what an unbelievable shift that was and that we have this privilege now where before the people of God did not. They did not worship in that way. And so every time that we worship, we have that. We're approaching the throne of grace to worship and find con- and confidence and find help in our time of need. Amazing truth. And again, if, to think if we just kind of went down that list before we came to church and said, Lord, help me to worship in this way this morning, it would, revel- it would change the way we worship on Sunday mornings. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, well, you know, we got time. Uh, worship is our ultimate purpose. We've talked about this. Uh, we should be addressing one another, says in Ephesians, Paul writes, and we'll study this in our small groups, but that we should be addressing one another. This is a regular practice. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. This should be a regular practice of what we do when we as Christians gather together. Is that God created that. We have this creativity We to enjoy music. It is part of who we are because we're using the songs, singing, melodies as part of our worship experience together back to God. So let's talk about genuine yeah. worship. <clears throat> So true worship happens in the invisible and spiritual realm. One of the questions we said we'd address is what does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? And we don't have a lot of time to dig deep into this, but Gruda makes the point that it's not talking about the Holy Spirit there, but within the we worship in the spiritual realm when we worship in spirit and truth. And he made the connection in Luke 1 with Mary when she finds out from the angel what's going to happen. It's amazing. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Was, and that, so she's, that's that spirit, worshiping in spirit and truth. And then, I really like this. We talk about genuine worship. We truly worship when we see who God is and then we respond to Him. And I think we've talked about this. Really, We talked about it right in the beginning when, in our opening discussion. Isaiah 6 And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Matthew 14, this is when Jesus is walking on water and Peter's there. Remember, Peter gets out and sinks. And anyways, and those in the boat, he got back in the boat that they worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Now, they were able to see that. But I like that this is a, it's a response. When we really think about who God is, is not, is it not a natural reaction to want to worship and be thankful? It should be. And this is where we got to think that the world doesn't get this. The world gets none of this. They don't understand their original purpose in creation. If, and this is why you think the, the world fills itself with other things because they're trying to fill, there's, there's a purpose they were created for, they're not fulfilling. So there's that emptiness there because they're not. And so you fill that with all kinds of other things. But you know how easy it is for us to replace? We talk about... We should be worshiping, but how easy is it for even us in the church to allow other things to replace that? Right? It's easy to worship other things, isn't it? And we can just run through your list. We can worship bank accounts. We can worship our families, wife and children instead of God. We can, I think Chris, you said it, as we put these things ahead of God and worship. And yet these are all created things. We can worship our health and fitness and all of these things. We can worship money, jobs, 401ks, retirement plans. And it's very easy to allow these things, which are temporary and created things and false, will never last, but yet it's easy to do so. John Calvin Please. said that our hearts are idol factories. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. True, true, isn't it? True. Yes. Very, very true. So this is Grudem's quote. I like this. Therefore, genuine worship is not something that is self-generated, 
or that can be worked up within ourselves. It must rather be the outpouring of our hearts in response to a realization of who God is. So just think about that for a minute. There's some good truth there, isn't it? And so I wrote in my notes here, when we see God for who he is, I say when I see God for who he is, worship then it just is really nothing more than a natural response for those who follow Christ, isn't it? It is. How could it not be? And I, I would make the statement as I thought about this that if I'm not experiencing that, then I get the, am I really experiencing who God is? Because if that's a natural response, it should be. How can it not be? And that, that should be um, something every believer is experiencing. Yeah. yeah, as an unbeliever, I think I experienced tears of joy when my kids were born. Mm. And I, since, since I became a Christian, I experienced tears of joy dozens of times a week, mm. whether I'm listening to music or seeing beautiful sunsets. Or, <coughs> I'm so much more touched as a believer than I ever was as an unbeliever. Yeah, right. You experience God's common grace, that joy of watching. Who doesn't? That's, that's, God gives that grace to all the world, believers and non-believers alike, with family and to enjoy marriage, to enjoy all these things, yet how different it is when we're redeemed and we understand the Creator who did it besides just grace. Someone else had a hand up. Yeah, Russ. Let me ask a question. Good. Uh, so is true worship or worship... <clears throat> It is not of us, am I right? Yeah. It is of God. Yeah. You know, so you know, we talk in terms of oh we need to we need to worship <coughs> But yet anything we do, anything good that is of us comes from God. It yeah. is of God, right? right. And so yes. our perspective yeah. this needs to be that it is of God. So yeah. right. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. Very well said. That's why I like that natural reaction. It's we're, we're, we were created for a purpose, and we're fulfilling that purpose. And it's a natural response. It's just a natural response for the believer. And I think, as with sanct, as a process, we studied sanctification, right? And a new believer may not experience that. Well, know, sometimes new believers do because it's also new and fresh. But the point is, I think that grows as we grow deeper and more Christ-like. I find that my worship grows deeper as well. It does, and more frequent. And I find as I get older, there's more and more times I can't finish the song or finish the verse because there is emotion there, just gratitude and thankfulness. And it just seems more and more common and natural as I get older. But again, that's not because I'm figuring this out. You're absolutely right, Russ. That's because they, that's God's spirit at work within me as it is with all of us. It's a good point. Okay, a uh, few minutes left here. So... Two more uh, slides we want to go over. Factors that contribute to genuine effect and effective worship. Take a look at these. So he gets very practical in the last two. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on his personal statements because that's what they are, personal statements. And I'll let you read those on your own. Uh, but just take a look at this. So as we think of as a church, what are some things that we could, con how do we contribute to all of us gathering together? I guess you could look at this also as so we don't do anything that would be distracting from true worship as well. So how do we do that as a church? How do we do that in our personal lives? Take a look at this for a minute. I think letter E may be a little subjective, right? There's some subject, sub, subjectivity, because some could argue it's really hard for me to worship with the black ceiling in the church, right? So I think there is some preference to that too, but I, th I think he was, Grudem was talking about, but you're right, we don't want to do anything that would be distracting, but there is some personal preference in there. Thoughts on this list? How we can have genuine worship? Yeah, Pete. I think the, e, I looked at E too, and I think if I had one, not criticism, but if I had one thing to ponder about worship here, or, or just the services here, is that we have become a very rushed church. Yeah. We've become a very rushed congregation. We go from service to service to service, and, and we're, when I first came here, this was the most congregationally friendly, um, after the service community of church I've ever been to in my life. I mean, people would stand and just talk. If you, would, you could have a conversation with someone, and sometimes those conversations take time. We are... In my, in my opinion, we are rushed. 
because there's another service coming in and we don't have enough parking, we all know that, yeah. and we're trying to solve that problem, but I don't know that the parking lot is gonna solve that issue, and that we've, and because of our building, I mean, the building is only yeah. size so big, I'm not, I'm not complaining, I'm, not, yep, right. I'm, just, I'm yep. just pointing out that I think we have to be just careful that we keep time for things that matter. Right. Because when we come out of a worship service and a, and a message like is preached here, <clears throat> there's conversations that probably could happen. And I don't want us to come to church where we're so rushed that those are missed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. not only that, does everybody remember the hour and 45 minute services? Yeah. They were they, yeah, there used to be. It's just because we had more, we had less people. And there, I remember we went from, uh, Al was there on the, on the team when we went from one service to two. And that was a big, just trying to get, you know, the problem is, it's funny, I, I say problem, but it's just that people are coming, and so you get to a point where three services, I mean, it's just hard to get every, you're right. And one of the things Grudem said, a physical setting, he was more taught, it wasn't talking about the, the paint on the wall, what he's talking about was, is that do we have enough time adequately to do worship and to teach and to do these things. And you're right, we've had to cut down to one hour because there's just so many people coming. There's a thousand people coming on Sunday mornings now. We've never had this before. I mean, I, I, when I first came to the church in 2005, there was 225 people coming and they would rope off the sides and we all fit in the middle. And everybody who came went to lunch with Pastor Tim and Keith. Every, if you were new, you went to lunch because that's how small the church was. Now, those days are long gone. I, 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 I went and introduced myself to a couple sitting in the row across from me and said, hey, how long have you guys been coming? I gotta stop doing this. Like, are you guys new? <laughs> no, we've been coming for about a year, year and a half now. I'm sorry, I introduced, I just so many, I, but again, it's a nice problem to have so many, but our church has drastically changed. Uh, there's a hand up. Yeah. Going off of uh, like wise time allocation for church services, there's also the personal time allocation where if you don't have the time before the service as your personal or family, if you don't make the time to be up and ready and prepare yourself to come into the church to, to worship a holy God, there's nothing you can do in that service to, to really, you're not actually doing what you're supposed to. You're more worried about what you're doing, like you're late, you're arguing with the wife in the car, you're telling the kids to... Shut up. Stop. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say it. Yeah. Heard too many times. <laughs> He's not speaking from personal. He's not having a child experience. He's speaking from being a child. Being told, told to, to shut, shut up. up. Being told to shut up. We're going to church. Would you shut up? Exactly. And, and we have to prepare our hearts for yeah. that time. Right? Because yes, it's absolutely. so important that, that it, it, it's, it's an emotional time. It's an experience to have because you're... We're doing something that they didn't get to do before Christ came. They had to, again, it was a fearful, you almost, you literally faced God's wrath if you weren't in the right place. Well, it's the same way with us. If we don't have the right mindset, all we're going to face is God's wrath at the end of it because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah and we missed out on that whole, but you're right, because there is that, my, that's what I mean, my, my mindset and the way I come in on Sunday morning makes a difference? Am I rushed? Am I like, where's my heart at? And then it, lot, we made the connection with, uh, look at um, letter C, personal reconciliation. We talked about this, we talked about taking the Lord's Supper, is Matthew 5, hey, if, if you got an issue with a brother or sister, go make that right first, but then leave your gift, go make it right, and then come back to worship, make this right first. And so I think there's a lot of, again, connection with Matthew 5 even to this, how are we, and I, I appreciate what the teaching piece, I've heard from the pulpit many times is, are we prepared to worship? And we need to keep doing more and more of that teaching about what worship is, what our hearts should be, the importance of it, and we have to make time for it. I will, I will say you're absolutely right. It is difficult with three services to, to get everything in you want to do. And especially once I remember what we used to have, it's just not feasible with, because we got, I mean, thank the Lord, lots of people are coming. Lots of people are coming. We're glad they're coming, but it certainly has changed what we do and who we're able to do just feasibly as a church. Go ahead. I was just going to say along those lines, I can speak to that because I've been doing the child care check-in and, uh, this month, I think I've added eight new families who came for the first time. Uh, there was one Sunday where five new families came at the same time yeah. and with children, right, for the first time to village. 
And so I, I hope that we as the existing church and the body of Christ and the people who are welcoming these people can be prayerful for the church leaders that um, they can do this well because this is a problem that many church leaders would die for, right? But it is, it is an issue and it is something that needs to be figured out. How do we do this? How do we do this well? How do we honor God for bringing these new families to us? Yeah. Um, and how do we ensure that uh, it continues and bears fruit in the right. future? Right. Yeah, and I would, yeah. I would just follow up my own comments. I, as a leader, I hate people who bring up problems without solutions. Yeah. And, and I would say that what I, to, just to carry on with that, I never see the leadership saying, everyone needs to clear out to do another service. That, that's fantastic. It's, it's, it's how we feel. We, just, we, we sense the urgency. But the things that are being done are the right things. The whole renovation system, where there's now there's a lot more room for people to get together after the yep. service out of the foyer. There's a ton more room out there now. Yeah. Adding the parking lot spaces is going to make that even better. So I think the solutions being moved forward are the right ones. They're the only ones I can think of without building a new sanctuary, which is a whole other problem. Well, but I am encouraged that the leadership here has seen the vision for how to how to at least make this into a better situation, um, knowing that we're all facing it today, and we have a great problem. Yeah, so, it is good because most, the vast majority of churches in America are in decline. They really are. So it is a, it is a say it's a nice problem to have, but it has changed who we are as a church. Chris, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I mean, if, you know, if you're somebody who likes to talk, come to the third service. You got all the time. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're out by the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was good. You know, all, all yeah, honest, come to the last honest, service. You know, stay as long as you like. Hey, good point. That's awesome. Third service. Well done, well done. Last slide was this. This was, uh, Grudem added this in the second edition. This was his own personal take. And I, I, I looked through this and, you know, just personal observations. Is there a place for this in a systematic theology? But hey, you know what? He wrote it. It's his book. He gets to do that. That's fine. But he did have some interesting. We've talked about some of these, the worship. Is it a look at me or look at God atmosphere? And I think that's a worthy question. Volume is interesting. And he talked about it from a 70, I don't know, he said, in his 70s saying, you know what? It, He's got, it's sometimes it is, it's, it's just hard to, it's so loud. Can we, and he wasn't saying anything about preference of the music, just can we turn it down a little bit? And we've had people come get very, especially when we first, when they first uh, installed that sound system, the first few days of worship, I was up in the front by that subwoofer and I literally thought I was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> I could feel that, just that reverberation, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to move back. <laughs> and here I am, they, and anyways, I, but I can... Well, the other thing along with that is uh, when the guitar playing or the music the instrument playing is so loud that I can't hear the, the words. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. yeah, yeah, right. So anyway, I'll, I'll let you read through these. We're not going to go through them, but he talks about helping to have people connect more about knowing the songs. Are they easily singable? I found that that's a very subjective because my range of octave is so I, I can't hit half the high I mean I just I stop singing on the high if it's a line that's a high I just stop enjoy the music then I'll pick it up afterwards I don't even try to hit it I scare the people around me so you make you make that sound so easy I, I don't even know what that means <laughs> I, I don't even know what that means so that's good so I just stop. I just enjoy it, and I'll pick it up again when the high notes are done, which is almost every song I sing, because I can't hit it. I don't even try. You could always hum. You could always hum. Yeah, and humming is okay, too. Right, that's good. I'm a good hummer. The Lord doesn't share, give us all the same blessings. He blesses us all in different ways. And, and I, I, I think it's, it, it's crucial that we... we a man's got to know his limitations. A man's got to know the blessings that, that the Lord has given him. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to be in reality with that too, isn't it? Yes, it is. Let me close with this, man. As a follower of Christ, is what I wrote. If I, I'm going to use me, if I'm not truly worshiping God, then I'm not experiencing who he is. I think that's just a good way to end it. Because if I'm experiencing God and his blessings and just the majesty of who he is, then my heart is a natural overflow. It just happens. That's what I was created to do. I'm worshiping. It just is. And so um, I think that's a good place to end. Um, somebody want to close us in prayer? We'll wrap this up. Albert. Thank you. Father God, we thank you for who you are. Help us today to worship you with everything that we do, every thought that runs through our mind, every interaction we have. Um, 
God, help us to give glory to you for it and remind ourselves that everything good and everything difficult comes from you and that you will use it all to glorify yourself. And we are so grateful for that. We're grateful not only for who you are, for, but, but for the fact that you've called us to you. And so help us to live a life that honors you and glorifies you and uh, to show others uh, what's possible and what is available through you. We love you and we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. 52 next week.